Okay, so I guess I'll start. Uh, hi, welcome to another episode of Well, There's Your Problem. It's a podcast about engineering disasters and things which are related to engineering disasters. Um, I'm Justin Rosniak. I run this YouTube channel, Do Not Eat. Um, I do another series about urban planning using city skylines. I do a whole bunch of, uh, you know, history, urban planning, stuff like that. My pronouns are he and him. Um, and, right, we need to do more introductions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll jump in then. Uh, Alice Caldwell Kelly, I'm on a podcast called Trash Future, as well as doing this, and my pronouns are she and her. Uh, I guess I'll go next. Hi, Liam Anderson. Uh, I'm mostly just a dick on Twitter. Uh, I also get real mad in our YouTube comment section uh, for people who misgender Alice. Uh, don't fucking do that. Please just watch <laughs> another video. It truly is not that hard, people. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. Also, I work uh, doing bullshit data analysis because, as Alice has uh, indicated, the future is trash. Hmm. And I'm David Banks, uh, D-A underscore Banks uh, on Twitter. And uh, I wear a bunch of hats. I'm a... Uh, I write a column at Real Life Magazine called uh, uh, Building to Code, where I, uh, you know, say some stuff about culture and, and cities and technology. And uh, I, uh, I, I'm also a co-host on Iron Weeds, which uh, Justin was nice enough to, uh, to come on a couple of weeks. Pronouns are, are uh, he, him. I just want to point out, Roz, that uh, I was looking for your Patreon today. And so I searched do not eat. And two of the things that come up are age and face, which living with you is probably two of the more <laughs> horrifying Google searches I've come across. But I just want to know I, where I, where I, these people I, are that so badly. Like, it's, 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 it's like it's it's age, face and single. I, I have all of the above. <laughs> Take the express lane to your DM. Oh, you yeah. look on Google Images and it's just a bunch of packets of silica gel. That's, that's how I'm hoping to keep it, yeah. <laughs> I am eagerly awaiting the Do Not Eat uh, One erotic fan art <laughs> category. So if you want to DM them first so I can print them and I, put them I, on our walls, I, get at it me folks. Yeah, do, do, do some fan art for the show. What's like, what's like, a, yes, what's like a furry, but it's a train? <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, like a train oh. sona. All right, so let's do the episode. <laughs> so, um, today's episode is a little different from some of the other engineering disasters we did because we're going to talk about um, the whole field of traffic engineering, right? So, you know, not all engineering disasters are concrete, visible events. Some are, you know, caused by sheer institutional momentum, you know, causing just institutional rot, which is widespread and in this case, really affects the built environment almost everywhere. So just to be clear, we are, t we are saying that traffic engineering itself as a field is the disaster, right? Yeah, we'll, we'll, we're going to sort of talk about the, the social and political ideology of the field of traffic engineering and, and the economic and political conditions that allowed it to be as influential as it is, right? Because we usually think, especially if you were educated in engineering, you know, engineering is non-ideological, right? Yeah, it's just math. You add two big numbers together. In the most trivial sense, it, it is non-ideological, right? You know, if I'm doing calculations under a capitalist system, it's going to be the same as doing calculations under a communist system, right? The numbers are going to, you know, turn out the same. Uh, you know, the moment of inertia of, like, a wide flange beam doesn't change. If I'm doing it in the Soviet Union or if I'm doing it in America, other than the units change. Well, th that and under socialism, 2 plus 2 is 5, and we're all living in the most socialist number, 1984. Well, that is a nice thing about socialism, is you get a bonus number, right? If I have two things and I put them with another two <laughs> things, I get a bonus thing. Not, not a lot of people talk about that factor of socialism. Well, it's because right now under capitalism, like... Jeff Bezos has all of the extra things, and we have to take those things and redistribute them to needy fours to turn them into fives. Yes. 
engineering tends to cultivate a mode of thinking which you know discourages criticisms of social and economic systems that control what engineers are allowed and paid to create right and traffic engineering is really a number one where you really see this occurring folks are paid to create very expensive very complex systems which cause the problems they're designed to alleviate I mean, one thing I will say about engineering as a mode of thinking is that that is also something that is true under quote-unquote socialism, state capitalism, whatever, as it is in uh, our more familiar form of capitalism. Like, the whole premise of Chernobyl, the show, is about this, is that you don't necessarily think about building a nuclear reactor any more than you think about building a highway as a political act, right? Absolutely. And I, I think there's also the, you know, uh, where the, the, uh, the individual engineer sees his or her uh, uh, agency or like where, where that begins and ends. Because uh, if you build something and it falls apart and it breaks, then that's on you, right? And like you can go to jail for that and, or uh, lose uh, whatever licensure uh, you have in your country. But um, if you build something uh, to spec, uh, and it still destroys society, you have technically still done the right thing. You're still a good engineer. There, there's very mm-hmm. few instances where you can say, uh, like, I did everything as I was told, uh, and it was still wrong. You know, like all the, uh, and, I, and there's a, a growing amount, but still not enough, I think, uh, like, uh, uh, parts of engineering education where we train people to, to get ready to to deal with that and navigate that sort of problem. Well, I mean, e- ethics in engineering is when you uh, like take a giant flask of whiskey onto the job site, or you, I don't know, add two and two together and get six instead of four or five, right? It's when you spell boobs on the calculator. It, you have to design a bomb that works for the client so they can blow up an <laughs> orphanage. Yeah, I mean, I think at places, especially, obviously, I live in Philadelphia. Uh, and in any part of the United States, you know, defense contracting is a huge part of the economy. But the people I know who work at Lockheed Martin or the Boeing, for them, it's, you know, I'm not seeing the effects of the bomb or engineering. I'm not seeing the effects of, you know, an AC-130 gunship mowing down a village in Yemen. And I think that just as a profession, maybe more so than others, you, you just think, well, all I'm doing is designing the bolts that are going that are going into an F-35. I'm not seeing the effects of, like, what it looks like when whatever depleted uranium munitions kill a whole bunch of people. Because it's just not something you ever think about. Well, I mean, in, in fairness, if you're designing bolts for the F-35, you are doing praxis, because you're probably going to kill <laughs> more pilots than uh, Yemeni civilians. It's Nailed true. It. it can't fly upside down. One point four trillion dollars, everybody. <laughs> oh, absolutely, oh, yeah. All right, we're ten minutes so. in, and uh, <laughs> we're on the first slide. Let's let's get going. So I want to start. Oh, I just want to start by talking about <laughs> sort of the history of traffic engineering here. Right? How how did this field start out? So we we start back in like the nineteen hundreds and the nineteen tens. Right? So. Back in the day, it was only rich assholes who had cars, right? I mean, so, so, someone had to invent the car, and then, obviously, you can't just give cars to everybody. You have to make them expensive. And yeah. And then they were pretty crappy cars. You know, they were like Stanley Steamers. You had to stop every 10 miles to let them, you know, build up a head of steam. Uh, but then you could go pretty fast. I mean, they'd do 40 miles an hour. And so folks complained about uh, joyriding, right? If you didn't own a car and you were walking on the street... You know, uh, you were complaining about these people driving their cars down the road real fast, and they're running over kids constantly. They're running over old people. That really, that really takes a lot out of the Great Gatsby to know that it was like a social phenomenon. It's like including the fucking knockout <laughs> game in the Great American Novel. <laughs> yeah, and that, it, that is it, that's not too far off from the truth. I don't think. Yeah, like I think you know people reading that uh the great gatsby like like when it came out would totally recognize that scene as like a as that a, a known quantity yeah, yeah absolutely like this rich asshole just just mows a kid down with his car yeah they're like we were waiting for that to happen it happened like constantly yeah before we had the car we used to think of streets as like a public place of congregation as well as a place for transportation to occur 
right? And it's usually safe for most pedestrians and uh, users of the street, as long as you were staying out of the streetcar tracks, which, you know, you generally knew where the streetcar was going to go, because um, it's on tracks. Harder to get run down by a horse, also. Also true, yeah, the horse, the horse has a bit of sense to it. Um, not much sense, horses are pretty dumb. <laughs> car good, train, uh, I mean, uh, car bad, train good, uh, horse dubious. We'll revisit Wild this car. later, yeah. Chaotic neutral. Pretty much. When people were still trying to figure out what to do with uh, with movie uh, cameras, and with film cameras, and, and they're just like throwing them on things and like, you know, setting them in front of a, a factory door and just like watching people come out. And they're like, that's a movie. Uh, they were also putting them on streetcars and you can like go on YouTube, you know, definitely don't pause this and go to another one, wait till afterward. But, you know, uh, you can go and find like videos of of like San Francisco's Market Street before the mass adoption of cars and everything's just yeah moving like you can step out of the way of everything on the street yeah there it's moving pretty pretty slow except for the cars which sometimes like dart out and and you just like imagine as you know more and more people buy them and it's only in the span of like 40 years that we go from the first electric street car to mass adoption of automobiles in the United States that, you know, you know it's, like it's only like 40 years. And in that time frame, you have, uh, you know, the street changes completely. And it, and it starts with like 30,000 people a year getting mowed down by cars and it only went up. And now it's back down to like what it used to be at like 30 to five to 40,000 people just dead every year in the United States, in alone, just the United States uh, because of a car accident. Yeah, and, and, and folks were, you know, they pretty early on, we realized that, like, these cars, they're they're like bad news, right? So folks tried to limit the speed and use of the automobile through, you know, local ordinances. Like, uh, I think Cleveland tried to get governors installed on cars to limit them to 25 miles an hour, like in the 19-teens or so. Um well, the 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 um the English equivalent was to make uh, to mandate a guy walking in front of the car with a big red flag. That that is also still law in Pennsylvania, not very well enforced. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, drivers start, you know, uh, these things called auto clubs, right? And um, they want to encourage legislation that allows uh, for more widespread use of the uh, automobile, right? So one of the things they did was they invented the concept of jaywalking, right? And uh, jaywalking is like you're, you're not crossing the street at the appointed locations, which was also a new concept. Um, and, and they sort of solidified the idea of, you know, the street is a place for transportation, not for public congregation. Yeah, it's, it's always great to think of uh, how, you know, like being called a J was like being like a country bumpkin and you're like just like staring up at the at the big towers with your mouth open and and then to like enshrine that into law. You know, it's just like, you know, you're, you're like you're an asshole. It was like getting a ticket for being an asshole is it, mm. like kind of kind of remarkable. It's a remarkable feat of uh, of public relations turn, turned law. Not, not to say this about every single issue, but boy, I hope this isn't uh, enforced in a deeply racialized and class-based no. way. Uh, no, fine. no, that was fine. No, that never just, happened. No, yeah, that didn't happen. <laughs> I think it's worth noting here that uh, 200,000, 210,000 Americans, uh, half of whom were under 18, were killed in traffic accidents from 1920 to 1929. Uh, which is a fourfold increase over the death toll of the previous decade. And keep in mind, uh, like, I think along with what you were saying about class, you have to consider that, like, the Model T by the 20s cost, I think, the equivalent of, like, 20 ish thousand dollars. No, it was below, like, $8,000. Mm-hmm. So you have all these people who, in their lifetimes, went from not having a car or not ever seeing one to just, like, it's really hard to teach people like in less than a generation, like, oh yeah, these death machines, you have to look out for these now. It's it's just wild to me. That's why you never had a Bolshevik revolution in the States, is same sort of time frame, nineteen twenties, and just all of the angry, poor young men, which is who you need for a revolution, just get mowed down by cars instead. <laughs> yes. It, it is actually to look, interesting to look at when people got like um 
or, or people in, in which uh, camp, which political camp uh, uh, cared about which uh, transportation technology. So like today, you know, socialists love trains and, uh, and uh, uh, more people to the right like cars. Uh, but it's, it, it was, you could almost see it reversed in the turn of the 20th century because you had like a, a Soviet uh, de-urbanists that want, that saw the, the city as nothing but capitalist and you couldn't save it. So you want to like spread everything out uh, following sort of like a Frank Lloyd Wright sort of model. And then, uh, uh, and then you, whereas trains were obviously like the capitalist technology, right? Because that's what... All, all yeah, the, yeah, like Ayn Rand. Yeah, right. Yeah, who just like loved loved that trains could like kill teachers and public defenders. <laughs> yeah, you ju- you just route the train line through the Union Hall, and then the big locomotive just fucking takes it all out in one go. Very convenient. As part of the lobbying efforts, uh, I actually just found this out. The Packard Motor Car Company, uh, as part of the PR campaign against jaywalkers. Uh, went so far as to construct tombstones enga- engraved with the name Mr. J. Walker. Uh, public shaming, all of that. So again, you're going from in 20 years, just from like, oh, people belong on streets to only cars belong on streets, and you will literally like be murdered and shamed if you dare to change that. Yeah, and and this was you know a lot of the advocacy for, was from the industry, but another part of it was from you know auto clubs taking the initiative, right? So, you know, these are mostly composed initially of the rich assholes driving cars, right? Advocating and lobbying for better and safer road infrastructure, and they just go out and install, like, signage and lane markings on public streets. You know, like, this is, as you can see, this is a diamond-shaped stop sign from uh, Los Angeles, right? Um, which, you know, they, they just went out and they used their own money to install the stop sign. Um so the thing is that this the safety infrastructure that they're installing you know which is put in in the name of the safety of all road users is you know being put in by the auto clubs so it pretty quickly establishes the dominance of the car over the entire you know public street right yeah but you're not going to be the asshole who like questions uh you know it's a safety measure what's your problem Oh, and also, like the guy, that, the guy that is like at your uh, local auto club is probably your landlord. Also true. <laughs> yeah. Boy Scouts handed out cards to handed out cards to pedestrians, warning them against the practice of jaywalking, like mock trials and all that stuff too. So a lot of what feels like just kind of collective pressure, even if it wasn't like the automobile companies themselves, which is wild. There was a mock trial with Boy Scouts. I don't know if it involved the Boy Scouts, but uh, the but like there were mock trials conducted in public settings to shame or ridicule offenders. Uh, I I am unknown as to whether or not the Boy Scouts were some sort of weird kangaroo court just, for jaywalkers. Just just being like if, if you jaywalk, you help the Kaiser. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, waiting for it. So as um as long distance trucking becomes a thing. Um, the Federal Highway Aid Act sort of improves highways, not not to the extent that the interstate highway system would, but improves it better. And with the introduction of the Model T Ford, which let, you know, more and more not especially rich people uh, start using cars. Mm, and to start buying Henry Ford's Dearborn Independent newspaper, which was virulently anti-Semitic. Oh, uh, yes, they also did that, yes. Like they put it in, in, in the dealerships. Every Model T Ford came with the copy of, you know, like, the Protocols of the Elders. I just think about how insane that is. That's like buying, like, uh, I don't know, like a, a pickup truck now, and it comes with a QAnon thing in, like, the I mean, glove box. I mean, you, it, it is kind of... I remember that, like, that Hummer commercial back in, like, 2006 or something, where it was, like, a, a, a beta cuck puts a carrot on the... the, uh, the the checkout counter at the grocery store and then someone behind him has like a big pile of meat and the guy with the carrot is like oh no my masculinity and then like they go out into the parking lot and he gets into a prius and the meat guy goes into a hummer and then the prius guy is like ah my dick's falling off or something and he has to like run to the hummer dealership to get like to re-secure his masculinity like that was a commercial it's like 
It's like that, except the tagline is something like, uh, Hillary Clinton was secretly arrested and executing in Guantanamo Bay. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Just, Henry Ford invented American anti-Semitism and also the Model T. And square dancing. Like, no shit, he was a huge pusher of, of square dancing in schools on the basis that it would displace jazz music, which was too degenerate. Forgot about having to be... be I was taught square <laughs> dancing in school. I, I know we're going to talk about Robert Moses later, but I feel like Henry Ford is the other guy, along with Robert Moses, who you can kind of trace all of the bad things back to yeah. for some reason. Car dealerships, you know, they have this un uninterrupted, very rich culture. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is, like, completely unchanged since uh, for a hundred years it's just nothing but but shitlords uh peddling conspiracy theories and toxic masculinity that's a <laughs> well you know why you need the undercoating is because obama was born <laughs> in kenya and the, the all-weather mats really keep uh, the blood uh out of your car <laughs> When you've been you've been curb stomping, you know it's really yeah, you you you're gonna need those mats when Jade Helm comes up and the black helicopters like come over, yeah. Trunk space for all your AK forty sevens. So this thing called um, <laughs> Ashto was formed. It's the Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials. Uh, it was called Asho when it was founded because they didn't include the transportation part. Um, this was founded in 1914. It's a private nonprofit which developed road and highway standards so that drivers, you know, could drive everywhere without like being confused by local auto club like road signs because they were different everywhere, right? Mm. You turn the street into a different like a different neighborhood, and all of a sudden the stop signs are purple. Yes, and in cursive for some reason. Oh yeah, I too have been to Quebec. <laughs> Yeah, to, to give you a sense of how bad that could be, when I was working as a carny in Florida, and you'd go do a, sh a, a, a an event at a private, like, rich person, like, golf club thing, they would have signs that say, drive leisurely in cursive. Oh my god. And so, you could, so you could just imagine, like, every city... With like the worst people in it deciding what the signs yeah. look like, yeah, it's it's it. it's a small thing, but uh, almost every London borough has a slightly different kind of street sign. So the name of the street is going to be like in a different font and color and shape and size every time. That's helpful. That is helpful. It's yeah, it's great. Ashto published the first manual on uniform traffic control devices, and that standardized a bunch of road signs, right? And that's where we got the stop sign from, for example, which used to be yellow. Now, now, now it's red. Huh? Why? Why? Why'd they change it? It ripened. <laughs> yeah, it was. The, it was like a limited edition, like lemon lime stop sign. Around this time, we 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 um in the 1920s, we come to this concept of the Parkway, right? So the Parkway, uh, the idea is we have a limited access road, right? So you can only access it via ramps. Um, which is free of trucks and commercial vehicles. Uh, and, you know, you can use it for, like, a scenic, leisurely drive as opposed to driving through the center of town. It, it's, it's sort of envisioned as, like, uh, you know, a park amenity, or it's like, you know, you, you do this for leisure. But in practice, almost immediately became, like, high, a high-speed commuter route, right? Well, largely because they could never figure out why you park on the driveway and drive on the parkway. It's true. What's up with that? Yeah, but I, I just love the idea that you go to say New Jersey, you know, for yeah, you know, for, for for vacation, and you bring back a postcard of the Garden State Parkway. Hmm. Well, it, also the giant congestion, just because everybody's in their shitty Fords, leaning out of the windows, shouting the drive on the parkway joke to each other, constantly. <laughs> oh, for what it's worth, stop signs uh, were yellow, because they couldn't find uh, red pigments that wouldn't fade until, like, the 50s. <laughs> and then they just painted them all in lead. <laughs> awesome. Uh, and asbestos. Uh, you know, some of the fo most famous parkways that were originally built were, like, the northern and southern state parkways in Long Island. Those are... Robert Moses built those, and, you know, everyone knows he built the bridges deliberately too low for buses. But, like, other parkways that had built been built previous to that were, you know, also... Like, they excluded commercial vehicles. It was only for cars, right? Um, which included buses, of course. 
and that's a practice which continues till this day. A lot of parkways do not allow buses, including those which are, you know, explicitly designed for transportation, uh, like, say, the Baltimore-Washington Parkway. Uh, although I think Megabus uses it anyway. They just haven't gotten caught yet. Yeah, so if you're watching this snitch on Megabus, um, uh, it's interstate transportation <laughs> called the FBI. Uh, it's it's the only time it's ever justified to, like, rat somebody out to yeah. the feds. Is, is, yeah. It's probably wire fraud. Probably counts yeah. as wire fraud, too. <laughs> yeah. It, what isn't wire fraud? Th- th- this podcast is probably wire fraud. I'm gonna make it wire fraud. The bus has Wi-Fi. That makes it wi- wire fraud. Yeah, there you go. Mm. Even to this day, the National Park Service is the second largest operator of highways in the United States. I'm getting pulled over by a park ranger. An amazing experience. Those guys are scary. Yeah, I got. Yeah, I got. Yeah, they they are not here. Yeah, to I got out. Uh, like um, reamed out by a, a park, like a, a freshly minted pair of park rangers. Like um, my wife and I were on our anniversary at, in Bahaba. And uh, we were just drinking, and these like two dudes are uh, just start talking to us, and we us, and we just chatting. And uh, it it just so happens that they're uh, like these state troopers, and they just like we just like just the slightest pushback about cops, which we can't not do. And they it just like stuck, just stood up and started shouting, and like it was wild. Yeah, those people are crazy. Awesome. That's that that that's the temperament that you want yeah. on yes. your public servants. Yeah. Yeah, I've. Uh... I've I've had interactions with park rangers uh, in Pennsylvania, and the the pace at which they go from zero to just like I'm gonna burn your whole family is fucking insane. Like, what are you mad about? You spend all day in a nice forest doing fucking nothing. They're, they're mad because like, <laughs> only you can prevent forest fires, Liam. Oh uh, well, good to know. I'm gonna burn yeah, everything. But you can steal as much weed as you want. Like yeah, from from <laughs> everyone that comes into the park, you, you you can run your car all the time. You're just constantly idling, so it's not it's never too hot or too cold. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. like it, it's you're, you're basically playing Firewatch. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah, like what's the problem? You get a cool hat. I think the hat's cool. Is that weird? I think Canadians have a better hat. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah, we're gonna need to call you in on that. Yeah. After after Parkways were come up with, we we come up with this idea which is pioneered by the Pennsylvania Turnpike of, you know, just the the straight up, this is just a highway, <laughs> right? You know, it's a limited access highway. It goes, you know, you can drive very fast on it. Um, it has a direct route. Um, and you can also have trucks and buses on it, right? Pennsylvania Turnpike was, of course, a toll road. It still is to this day. And the way the Pennsylvania Turnpike was designed was... Uh, it, it gave a wide berth to, you know, cities. It got close to them, but it didn't go into them, right? So it's it's an autobahn, then. I mean, this is 30s, right? Yeah. So we're, we're thoroughly into the period of, like, ripping off uh, that guy in Germany who had a bunch of, like, weird ideas. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, he, he was, like, a vegan. He didn't like smoking. It was all weird. This is in DSA. <laughs> uh, oh, but also the, uh, the autobahn, they weren't using... Um cut and fill techniques so you could like mm. go you could go airborne like hitting a <laughs> hitting a peak or something uh and this is somewhat I, th- I think this is mostly true with uh with railroads in the uk also is that you are uh you have a lot of labor but not a lot of resources uh oh yeah and, and, yeah, and yeah. i mean the, the the thing with with like uh national service in germany in the like 30s was you just get a bunch of unemployed guys with shovels right. and that's it yeah. and you just build the highway Where, the whereas thing. in the united states it's the opposite and so you can you don't have a lot of <laughs> so it's one guy with a bunch of shovels <laughs> well you can you can dr- you well you build like around obstacles a lot of the time so you get these big wide turns instead of like cutting through something or, or mm-hmm. going up and over it, like uh, like the the original autobahn, which I think is largely uh, ripped up now. The uh, the, uh, the autobahns were also, uh, I, if I recall correctly, they were um, 
they were built under uh, the Social Democrats in uh, Weimar Germany, as opposed to, you know, we attribute that to the yeah. Nazis. But once again, the Nazis were, you know, stupid, incompetent people. And, you know, they just took credit for everything the Social Democrats did. Mm. They did invent having the, uh, like, uh, rest stops and, like, gas stations having a little kitsch sort of local style. So we wouldn't have had that <laughs> without the rise of fascism. <laughs> It's weird because uh, the Pennsylvania Turnpike was just like this weird uh, homologation up between like the old Philadelphia and Lancaster Turnpike, which was completed in like 1794, and then like a railroad which was never built. So uh, between like Pittsburgh and Harrisburg, uh, it's all shitty and meaningless. And you just go through, we would have gone through all these like switchbacks and very dangerous curves. So now you can still do that, yes. but you can do it at 75 miles an hour. Awesome. Highly recommend it. We don't have Nazis officially. You got to go like two miles off the turnpike <laughs> and then you'll be in, in near in York County and you yeah. can say hi to both my parents and some That's Nazis. That's pretty convenient. And uh, yeah, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, which gave the world Charles Bronson. The next time I go to Chesapeake House on I-95, I'll remember... The Nazis gave us this little kitschy roadside stop. Uh, uh, you like Chesapeake cows. <laughs> also, fun fact: the word turnpike comes from the toll, where you you have a pike in the ground and you turn it to let people pass. Mm. That's a that's why that's why toll roads are called turnpikes. Huh. So. The Pennsylvania Turnpike, uh, as well as, of course, the Autobahn, is immensely influential on uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower, who was part of a uh, uh, an infamous trip across the United States by a road convoy, <laughs> which took uh, a month and was just a disaster, right? Well, I, I like the idea that he got the, like, he was just riding a tank or a staff car across the, like, bombed out ruins of an autobahn and was like, you know, this is not a bad <laughs> idea in principle. Eisenhower's administration managed to pass uh, the National Interstate and Defense Highways Act in 1956, and the intention was to build more highways like the Pennsylvania Turnpike. Uh, which, you know, avoided urban areas entirely, sort of allowed for travel between them, but not, you know, directly into the city center. But uh, a guy named uh, Robert Moses intervened on that, of course. And you got to remember, of course, also these were defense highways. Yeah, it was the yeah. Cold War. Everything had to be, like, defensive. Uh, the, when, when Eisenhower was uh, con still considering... Uh, the highway system. They named it after him, so that's sweet in the pot. But one thing is also that it was like, oh, what a coincidence. It's named, It's got the same name as me. I might as well pass this. No, but it was also uh, uh, the, the committee was headed by uh, a General Motors board member. So it was pretty clear what the answer was going to be. David sent me this earlier today, and he's like, I think it's from the New York Times. New interstate highway system will help troops seize communist neighborhoods. <laughs> <laughs> and one yeah. mile in every five is straight, so you can use it as an airstrip. <laughs> then, then we realized it was from the Onion. Yeah, which also uh, I enjoyed the the thing in the bottom left as a juxtaposition or residents of New Mexico given cardboard three D glasses for protection against <laughs> atomic radiation. Like I, I was ready to believe that all of that was true. Like we're just like I mean that's that's basically the truth, honestly. If you look at some of the testimony, it's just like dudes being like, yeah, we weren't really told that standing under an atomic bomb blast was bad for us. And the government was like, you should have known. What are you mad about? There was, there was the guy who um, lit a cigarette off of Castle Bravo by like focusing a, a mirror and like holding the cigarette up to it and like lighting it off the nuke. I, that sounds dope. I want to do that. Yeah, that's way cooler than like quoting the Bhagavad Gita or whatever. As just like fucking lighting a, a, a an unfiltered Marlboro off of a, a nuclear explosion. Yeah, I think I, men don't do that anymore because of can cancel culture, I guess. Right? Is that is that <laughs> the idea? Right. Yeah, that's what we blame. Now we're on. too busy ch we're too busy checking each other's pronouns. Yeah. To detonate nuclear weapons, <laughs> uh, to use them as cigarette lighters. Yeah. Meanwhile, gender reveal parties are like literally killing people. Oh, that's true. Yeah, didn't they just have the, like the second gender reveal <laughs> fatality? Yeah, you deserve that. Best you country. deserve it. Like you deserve it. Honestly, <laughs> uh, it's also worth noting that. Uh, so, two reasons it's it's got defense in the name. 
uh, some of the original cost was diverted from defense funds, and most U.S. Uh, Air Force bases have like a direct link to the interstates. So, in the event you had to mobilize your shitty ass F four mm. just to get uh, ripped apart by some fucking MIG, at least you could do that. Well, quickly. like, and and now that's used by a bunch of um, enlisted airmen in uh, Mustangs that they have on like uh, payments and like on variable term mortgages and shit, just backed up one against the yes. other for hours commuting. Awesome. And the reason right, for right. that is, of course, Robert Moses. Uh, Robert Moses pioneered the concept <laughs> of the urban freeway, right? But the urban freeway, more specifically as a tool of uh, urban redevelopment and social engineering, right? Are those just two different ways of saying racism? Yes. Funny how that works. Robert Moses mostly worked in New York City, but he consulted on urban highway projects and plans across the country. If, if your city has a highway that cuts directly through... Um, you know, and they demolished a bunch of neighborhoods to build it, the chances are Robert Moses was a consultant, at least, on that plan. And Robert Moses worked with Eisenhower's aides uh, to draft the National Interstate and Defense Highway Act. And basically, that, that, that changed the requirements from what Eisenhower had envisioned, or at least from, you know, a Pennsylvania Turnpike-style thing that went around urban areas to something that went straight downtown and just wrecked all the buildings and neighborhoods. And that ultimately resulted in an interstate highway system which is, you know, worse and less functional than it should be, right? Yeah, but it, it was very good at the racism, though, so you can't, like, by, by its own policy goals, you know, it's fine. But it's very bad at moving people, right? The main leg of Interstate 95 goes straight through Center City, Philadelphia. You know, I-90 goes through downtown Cleveland. There's four interstates that converge in downtown St. Louis. I-5 goes straight through Portland, Oregon. You know, your interstate traffic has to commiserate with local traffic. So, you know, a a any, like, freight or, like, you know, folks driving from one city through another city to another city are delayed by commuters, right? And this is all because Robert Moses wanted to do racism and also anti-Semitism. Uh, he, he, he really liked driving freeways through Jewish neighborhoods, which is strange because he was Jewish himself. Sort of. He was raised as a secular Jew. It's worth noting that I, as a Jewish man, uh, do not endorse this and think we should <laughs> blow up the freeways. <laughs> At the very least, we'll find out which one Jimmy Hoffa is part of the foundation of. Just a skeleton just falling out of one. <laughs> and and then this massive in, influx of traffic into downtowns results in, you know, the need for uh, mass car storage. You know, we invent parking minimums, that whole that whole thing. And parking minimums, of course, can be a whole nother episode. Take us way back to uh, episode one of Franklin, wasn't it? Oh, no, it was um, park, uh, policy. Yeah. Yeah, and then there's also cities that... Or the, the reverse happens, where you build a highway and then cities grow around them, mostly in, in the south. And, like, from you know, where 95 starts in Miami all the way up, pretty much all the way up the, the east coast of Florida is, like, one continuous urban uh, highway. I, yeah, I, I mean, you've, you've got to put those tanning salons and, like, uh, people scamming each other into buying moth-eaten leggings that say girl boss on them <laughs> somewhere. Well, and then if you, if you connect... What's interesting is that, like, so there's, like, 75 on the west coast and 95 on the east coast. And then when you connect them uh, east-west uh, via, like, I-4 or 595, those are somehow, um, like always full of carnage like it's, it's it's something about crossing the streams that like there used to be this billboard on i4 which starts in tampa and ends in daytona and goes through orlando and it, would, it was just a billboard that just said stay alive <laughs> <laughs> i don't know there's something like deep and occult about this like they're built on ley lines or something absolutely like the energy intersects all right, so during the same sort of era, we're talking early uh, the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, uh, we start to develop the tools of the trade of traffic engineering, right? Uh, so our friends Ashto, remember a, a private organization, they developed the Red Book for Urban Highways and the Blue Book for Rural Highways, right? Um, and that's the geometric design of highways and streets, 
or for both conditions. The Green Book replaced both. That's what we're looking at here. That was a shitty movie. I would also say that this is definitely that the Ashto Red Book is the worst Red uh, Book. Yes. There, there's a little Red Book that's much better. Yeah, you should read that. Yes, yeah, that read that. It's littler. It has 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 some principles. <laughs> sound like my dad. <laughs> it has it has some principles on the design of highways that are a lot more practical, mostly involving how again you construct the foundations <laughs> out of landlords. The blue book and the red book were combined into the green book. Um, yeah, should have been the purple book. Uh, it depends on if you're dealing with light or if you're dealing with pigments. I believe. Uh, which which color space does Ashto operate in? Is the question. Is is it is it odd is it RGB or CMYK? Uh, doesn't matter. Do, do, yeah, doesn't matter. Read yeah, Mao. Yeah, read read Mao. Ashto publishes this that has <laughs> uh, policy on sight lines, safety, how to design the highways and streets, how much safety runoff area needs to be provided. Drivers lose control at speed. They also like to determine what should be the speed limits that we're aiming for. Mm. And th they were. They were making this stuff up as they went along, right? Like, this was the 50s, everybody was dying in, like, six different ways if your car crashed. You, you kind of just look at what was already built and say, hmm, that's probably should be the standard. Although, some freeways were built to higher <laughs> standards before um, these these documents were created, right? Like, there's a, there's a curve in the town of Normal, Illinois, which was designed for 100 miles an hour. Because that's what they thought. Maybe that's what highway speeds wow. would be in the future. Yeah, it's it, it, it's future proof. Is, is is that banked too, or is it just like a really gentle flat curve? It's just a really gentle flat curve. Awesome. I hadn't figured out banking yet. Truly having a normal one. In the 1950s, when these manuals start being uh, uh, published, there's you know there's this big pot of money from the uh, Interstate Highway Act. So they start getting the best and brightest uh, engineers into various engineering firms to design highways. Yeah, because because NASA wasn't a thing yet. So you. I mean, it kind of was, but you know. Yeah, it was still NACA then. I mean, that's not as cool a name. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Arba. If if you want to deal with dirt instead of rocket engines, dirt and asphalt, mm -hmm. traffic engineering becomes a really specialized field, right? You no longer have, like, engineers who can design, like, you know, you can design a road, but you can also design a railroad, or you could design public transit. You can only design highways because it's such a specialized field. In the early 1950s, we also get the Highway Capacity Manual, which is published, which uh, introduced a new method of determining how well a road or intersection is performing called level of service, right? And this is sort of, we're trying to objectively judge how roads or intersections are performing. Um, level of service is fairly intuitive. Roads are graded A through F, right? We have two kinds of levels of service. We have one for highways, right? And, you know, that goes from, like, free flow, which is, like, there's not many cars, you can go at speed, to um, forced flow, which is, you know, you're in sort of stop-and-go traffic. Uh, for intersections, you know, level of service A is determined on the delay. Uh, so, like, how many vehicles get through in a given light cycle or how long you're waiting at the intersection. Freeways were designed for, like, if it's, you know, rush hour, you're grade B or C. And urban roads usually for, like, C to E. And so everything is F now, though, right? Like, not to oversimplify. Everything was F almost immediately. Because <laughs> um, engineers used traffic forecasting methods, which were very complicated, um, to design for demand that they expected 20 to 30 years down the line, as opposed to the immediate demand, right? Because like, we don't want to upgrade intersections like every five years. We want to design for 20, 30 years down the road, right? Well, and it's like literally the only time the United States planned that far. <laughs> yes. But what was the quality of that planning? Were they like, oh, 20 to 30 years, rocket cars, surely. Jets and shit, uh, everybody's going to be floating, the dog's going to wear a little space helmet, or was it more reasonable? It was more like, well, we'll have more cars, we should make it a little bit bigger. Oh, okay, that seems, that seems fine. Right, so... Um, one of the things was about... 
one of the things that was a problem with forecasting <laughs> traffic is the, uh, this thing called induced demand, right? Is that as you increase the ease of travel, more people take more trips until, you know, some new equilibrium is reached. And that equilibrium is usually with similar congestion to what previously existed, right? And this was known very early on, right? Um, Robert Caro wrote in the Power Broker about um, Robert Moses. During the last two or three years before the entrance of the United States into World War II, a few planners had begun to understand that without a balanced system of transportation, in this case meaning roads and mass transit, uh, roads would not only... Uh, not alleviate transportation congestion, but would aggravate it. Watching Moses open the Triborough Bridge to ease congestion on the Queensborough Bridge, then open the Bronx Whitestone Bridge to ease congestion on the Triborough Bridge, and then watching traffic counts on all three bridges mount until all three were as congested as one had been before, planners could hardly avoid the conclusion that traffic generation traffic generation being the older word for induced demand, was no longer a theory but a proven fact. The more highways were built to alleviate traffic congestion, the more automobiles would pour into them and congest them and thus force the building of more highways, which would generate more traffic and become congested in turn in an ever-widening spiral that contained the most awesome implications for the future of New York and of all urban areas. Hmm. Love a love an old timey correct usage of the word awesome. There. Yes, but God, humans are so good at feedback loops, aren't mm-hmm. we? Like just spiraling ever upwards. Uh, yeah, it's, it's fine. The- uh, we're we're really good at like managing those intuitively, and um, we're all gonna die because of climate change because Robert Moses is building a bridge to build a bridge to build a bridge to. Yeah, yeah. great. At least, at least he could figure out how to make money off of it. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't even just in this field of, of, uh, of highway engineering that you saw those effects happening, right? Because also at that time you have uh, cybernetics and all these other like kooky uh, but groundbreaking uh, fields opening up and all of them are, are just noticing these similar yeah. patterns of either induced demand or yeah, like system contained systems like uh, finding equilibrium. Uh, yeah, it was, it was just like it was very predictable well, that this to, to come back to to climate. Like um, this happened with um, capping and trading emissions. Was um, yeah. everyone just buys the maximum amount of emissions credits, and then oh great, you can actually pollute more. So <laughs> it's like when Dale Gribble starts getting into the the <laughs> the, the carbon offset business, yes. and he's just like, yeah, he's like, actually, I don't have to plant trees. I just keep selling these yeah. things. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the the word that traffic engineers sometimes say, the more conscious ones, is like widening roads is trying to cure obesity by loosening your belt, right? I mean, I, I do be doing that. I, so do I. Same. <laughs> so I'll, I'll give you an example sort of of how these metrics have changed how streets looked. Um, so this is Spring Garden Street. In Philadelphia, this is the the one over here is Broad and Spring Garden, and I'm not exactly sure where this was. This was in the late 1800s and early, early 1900s, and you might notice Spring Garden Street had a garden, right? And there's trees, there's a fountain, you know, it looks very nice. Um, but uh, traffic engineers got their hands on it, right? Uh, they needed to make room for cars 20 to 30 years in the future, so. Uh, uh, this is what it looks like today. Hmm. Oh, yes. So yeah. I, I love to just stand in the median and just, like, inhale a bunch of, like, uh, air pollutants. Yeah. You should come to Philly. We could do that on the Saturday. I want to picnic on that median. Hmm. Yeah. Those, the trees, you know, those are a collision hazard. You got to get rid of them. Uh, you add some slip lanes to increase vehicle flow. There's a concrete median that's, you know, for safety, right? allow for higher speeds mm-hmm. of traffic. They had left turn lanes, which requires reducing, you know, the, the garden space. Well, e- even on the most, like, aesthetic level, once you've done all of that shit, you have to, like, throw a bunch of paint all over it so people know where to drive and how to drive and where to cross. 
and you had like some quite nice cobblestones and stuff, and now it's just like a series of very visually confusing and kind of dazzling uh, like contrasts. Yes. Well, and also, also like in the similar vein to like induced demand when you design for uh, that sort of safety, that definition of safety, you also design for speed. So you're removing all of the things that drivers use to like tell how fast they're going without looking at the speedometer. So if like things are close to you as a driver, you feel like you're going faster or you can at least sense how fast you're going. And so as you remove uh, collision hazards, as they're, they're usually thought of, you know, you're widening things out, you lose sense of speed. And so you're actually making people go faster. Yeah. It's very monotonous. Uh, in a place that yeah. you wanted people to slow down. One of the, the things, just kind of personal experience, is that so uh, where I used to live in, in New York, Pennsylvania, we live very close to a hospital. And so there's like what's ostensibly a, a like residential road. I mean, there are houses lining it. But because of the way it's built and because there's so much traffic from the hospital, you get people not just on that road going on like ungodly speeds, but also the roads through like my parents' neighborhood, which also has no sidewalks in a residential area. Um, so we had a problem, you know, when I was a kid, you'd have these people who just couldn't comprehend that like you cannot do 40 because like six year olds live here and the township just went absolutely bonkers because the hospital's like, well, it's not our fault. And it's like, yeah, maybe not, but like maybe design a system where 700 cars aren't going through a neighborhood just that is not designed for it at all. And they couldn't understand it. It was baffling. Sorry. No, the, ye the, the yelling is good. The yelling is practice. Yeah, that's, that's what we're here for. <laughs> yeah. And I, I mean, the, the sort of the monotony of it too, like it, 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 one street looks much like another street, and aside from like the obvious inconvenience of not necessarily knowing where you are, it kind of makes it very easy to lose your concentration, right? There's nothing sort of breaking up that, that visual information yeah. that you're getting while you're driving. They live in a neighborhood with trees, and like where my girlfriend used to live, that's not even true. It's, it's like the suburbs of Philly, and it's these very, very wide streets, and nothing to indicate yeah, you know that people live here. It, I think it really just fucks with your sense of uh, perception. Well, I, I I made I made a joke on the last one about um, I don't remember which city it was. It was oh it was Kansas City about like merging across twenty seven lanes of like a mile long freeway. Yeah, uh, it's pretty much like not to get too postmodern about it, but you also like you remove things that look like things that should make you slow down and so then you replace them with signs that tell you to slow mm -hmm. down right so instead of having cobblestones and trees that actually make you slow down you put up a, a speed limit sign yes. that tells you to slow down but you can disobey it's, a yeah. sign it, whereas like all these things that around you make you slow down it's a it's a worse system. it's weirdly more authoritarian and also not and also all of the information is going one way to drivers rather than to everybody and it kind of kills the idea of having like a like perceptible neighborhood which is great yeah yeah and i i mean like definitely like the signs are not good for you know enforcing safety as much as like the actual you know dangerous stuff we had to remove right and and the safety the way you know traffic engineering is structured is safety for who right so this is a street view of um the Lincoln Drive and City Avenue and I-76 and Ridge Avenue intersection, which all become Kelly Drive, right? Um, traffic here is usually going around 40 to 50 miles an hour, but the speed limit's 35, right? We can, you know, disobey signs because they're not cops, right? Um, not yet. <laughs> yeah, from, from now on... In the future, every sign is just a pair of absolutely psycho uh, park service <laughs> rangers. <laughs> so, you know, the speed limit here is 35, but there's big interstate-style signage, which is, I guess, behind the camera here. Um, there's large, broad curves, so on and so forth. At the left, we got the Schuylkill River Trail. And then further left is the Schuylkill River behind these trees, right? So... Uh, note the position of the guardrail here, right? Noted. Okay, so the idea here is we have <laughs> the guardrail so cars don't fall in the Schuylkill River, 
if the drivers lose control. We also have a safety runoff zone, right, in case you lose control of the vehicle so you don't <laughs> damage your car too much, right? Mm. Um, I see, I see a figure. Uh, if you look sort of midway between the car and the uh, the stop sign on the left, yeah, uh, there's a sort of a, a human shaped figure in the runoff zone. Is that meant to happen? The runoff zone. That's Justin, actually. There you go. That's a picture of Justin. You yeah, just him, just that's zoom it. in very very closely. Everyone, stop googling. Face reveal. Face reveal. That's that's the picture of me. You can be horny over it. Yeah. Um. So. <laughs> Yeah, so the runoff Done. zone is the Schuylkill River Trail, right? Which, you know, is very heavily used. It's a, it's a recreational trail, but it's also a commuter route between, like, Conshohocken and, and Philadelphia, right? I use this section of trail eight to ten times a week, and it's terrifying because everyone's going so goddamn fast, and I know that I'm the safety zone, right? <laughs> you are a crumple zone for the purposes of Yeah, this I'm idea. the crumple zone. But uh, this is what the safety manual says is safest, and if you design like this, this is how you don't get sued. Hmm. Because if, if somebody does end up in the river, like that's a lot of money and a lot of liability. Whereas if, if, yeah. if you the crumple zone become crumpled, let's say, that's, that's not so much, because you can bring out the, the book and be like, yeah, no, it's, it's, built, it's built to code, it's fine. Yeah, it's fine. You can't sue me. I just did what the book said. Yeah, it's it's uh, either you were uh, like crumpling irresponsibly, or it's just bad luck. There's there's no there's no politics conveniently. Uh, there's no design. Yeah. it's it's just it's it's a naturally occurring there's, intersection. There's absolutely no politics going on here whatsoever. There's uh there's just an objective safety, which doesn't consider certain people, but those people are apolitical as drivers are also, and and oh my god. I don't know how to... <laughs> that that, I, that I, guy I, telling you that you had too much politics in the engineering last time really got to you, huh? There's, it's wild too, just because like Kelly Drive uh, is also surrounded by uh, Fairmount Park. Uh, Boathouse mm -hmm. Row is there, so it's, it's absolutely wild. Uh, I have driven with... Uh, Roz on Kelly Drive, uh, and it is it is terrifying. Also, as a driver, and I I don't understand it like how it's such a major road. I mean, I hate driving on it. I won't do it by and large, and I'm not a cyclist. Yeah. Like I'll survive a car crash most likely. And Lincoln I, Drive, which merges right here, uh, throws a driver in the creek like every other day, uh, but. <laughs> Yeah, if you search the Kelly Drive tag on, like, our local news, it's just story after story of, like, horrific crashes because people will routinely do 50, 60 miles an hour at a road totally not designed for it and be like, why Why, why is everybody slowing down? Coincidentally, it's another parkway, uh, which the... is designed for cars only. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, the, the rapid and, in, quote, in... safe, unquote, uh movement of cars and cars only is priority number one in you know designing for in, in traffic engineering uh in roadway engineering and any kind of like engineering of streets and it has been for 50 60 70 years does does anyone here know why uh the complete streets uh design always has like the the two travel lanes of cars then a bike lane and then parallel parking shouldn't we switch the bike lane and parallel parking so that the car the parked cars protect it cyclists? was illegal in pennsylvania to have anything other than a parking lane next to the curb uh until or to right. have a parking lane in the place other than next to the curb until two years ago i think that's that may be determined by state departments of transportation one of the reasons it was took so long to be accomplished in Pennsylvania is because there were actual state laws against organizing it in a more sensible fashion. Right, and that, that's a common argument for, like, new urbanist planners who say, you know, like, good design is yeah. illegal, right? There's, like, it was, it was most of the, you know, like, new urbanists, get, or, you know, nine out of ten times say a lot of weird stuff, but a couple of things that they're that they're definitely right on mm -hmm. is, is that, and that there's all these moments where you realize that the way that the quote-unquote correct way or the way to not get sued you know to to 
engineer and design a, a road corridor is always one that not only like is mean to pedestrians or cyclists, but just like yeah. doesn't even we, think we, that they we have, yeah. Right, which is how which is how you get like parallel park cars mm-hmm. have to be next to the. Well, the we sidewalk, have um, yeah, let's say like critical support for numtots, maybe. I, I I would definitely say critical I, support I, for numtots, but there is definitely some criticism. Yeah, it's, to it's, be it's, made. It's, it's it's let's say the emphasis is on the critical. Yes. Yeah. The, the the thing about traffic engineering as a field, right, is um, when you have a hammer, every problem looks like a nail, right? Traffic engineering data, you know, what we collect is usually, it, it always points to one solution, which is widening roads, removing obstructions to fast-moving traffic in the name of safety or increasing speeds, both of which increase speeds, and building new roads. Uh Everyone in the industry knows about induced demands, but they would never do anything about it, right? Because if you actually did anything about it, it would destroy the industry. Well, I mean, Uh, apart from everything else, that's just a sexy aerial photo that you've put up. I love to merge at 70 miles an hour to go to the pub or sneaker outlet. Yes. or or, I like an interchange with curves. Mm Mm-hmm. It, it, is a, it is a thick interchange. Oh, I've almost killed you at this interchange. No, Twice. <laughs> Left to their own devices, traffic engineers will always build New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I guess we'll finish off here by uh, giving a few examples of like modern traffic engineering cause, uh, of, of stuff which is ongoing, right? So this is... Um, this is Interstate 95 revived. This is something the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation is doing right now. Mm. Um, now, I, I mentioned earlier that Interstate 95 should not be in the middle of the Northeast's second largest and second densest city. It's bad for all road users because of its location, and there's several bypasses which are readily available. You know, you could run it over the New Jersey Turnpike or I-495 to 276. And, you know, the elevated freeway in Philadelphia was falling apart. Well, PennDOT decides, well, let's make it bigger. But, 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 but right? it, it's, got, it's got trees on it. it, it you know, the, it's got some trees, it's got, yeah. It's got the trees. And also, I'm, uh, of some concern to me is the fact that most of Philadelphia seems to have been replaced with, like, featureless gray cubes. Um, that, that... Yeah, they, they, they should be, <laughs> they should be free, featureless brick cubes. I see. If we're being accurate. So this is uh, I-95 Revive is a multi-decade, multi-billion dollar project um, in order to widen I-95 through Philly, which it shouldn't be there in the first place. And um, it's actually involved like suspending public transportation to make room for the highway construction, right? We had uh, the smart. Yeah, that's the way to do it. The Route 15 trolley went all the way up to uh, uh, Richmond, which is a neighborhood in Philadelphia, and it was cut back uh, by like two miles to make room for the freeway they were rebuilding. It's been cut back since 2011. They may restore it in two years. Cool. And that that extra capacity is just going to fill up instantly as soon as it opens, right? Parts of it already are open, and they're already congested <laughs> as hell. Of course. SEPTA has had to borrow Mark equipment to, uh, to run bigger trains to alleviate mm-hmm. the congestion that's already here. Uh, and it's wild because that section of Philly like now has a casino and a whole bunch of shit, and there's no fucking way to get there on public transit that's not insane. And you still have to run across... Uh, like a street basically so there's a street called delaware avenue in philly that's kind of a pseudo highway uh speaking of long fast open roads it's um, just a fucking nightmare box you're erasing italian americans here it's called christopher columbus boulevard it wasn't until like 10 years ago man i don't (laughs) give a shit I just, I just love to stumble, stumble out of a casino at three in the morning and get taken the fuck out by, I don't know, a PC cruiser or something. <laughs> you will be mm-hmm. like that's that is your inevitable yeah. death in Philadelphia. I, it's super tight too because across from that is a residential area. I just 
That's my absolute favorite uh, part of Philly. Uh, one year on Christmas, uh, I drove up and down that because I just wanted to see the absolute shit show of like drunk old people leaving a casino at 3 a.m. on Christmas. And it was just a fucking horror story. It was great. Just Ralph Steadman drawings all through. Yeah, great. <laughs> yeah, all, all, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'd like to uh, draw attention to that triangle of green space right next to the highway. You know, it's like, what if we kissed next to the topiaries <laughs> uh, on, on next time 95? Uh, and it, it's just, it really is great how um, uh, renderings are always in like mm-hmm. the middle of yes. summer. Like, and you like that will always look like that all the time. Yeah, it definitely won't be definitely. four brown shapes with a parking lot in the mm-hmm. middle of it. There will be a beer garden. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fountain that never runs. Beer garden that charges <laughs> well, yeah. what, what if... for no goddamn reason. And people telling you how nice it is to walk their dog there. Fucking insanity. What, what if we kissed by the featureless gray cubes and we're both boys? Oh my. <laughs> this should be brick cubes. It's a similar situation, which is occurring in Portland, Oregon, where Interstate 5... This is a Sims-ass render. Yeah. Interstate 5 goes straight through the city, right? State Good officials God. want to widen the freeway and are providing some minimal capping of the freeway as part of the deal, right? You know, you have this nice grass lawn on these bridges here, right? And they also claim that widening the freeway is going to lower CO2 emissions. Hmm. Because the traffic will move faster through the neighborhood. Sure. So locally... Uh-huh. Why does... Why do the lo- why do the lawns not touch? That's really bothering me. Why, why is there a hole? <laughs> you gotta pay more for you that, pay yeah. More for that. I see. That's the DLC. I no, I think the reason why there there's a hole is because otherwise they'd have to provide actual ventilation, uh, like active I ventilation, see. right? So they want to do this as cheaply as possible. There's very little green space actually being added through this capping. Well, I mean, that's clearly from from Sim City. That's zoned as a low density residential. So yeah, I I, I can't imagine what value engineering is going to do to that 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 whole space it's just gonna be a a field of concrete so if you look at this little uh stub of pavement over here that connects to another stub of pavement over here right now and that's apparently a major cycling route (laughs) and uh they've decided that instead we're gonna you know we're gonna provide you with all this extra infrastructure but we're gonna cut off the route that people want to use right so now when you when you take that same route either for convenience or because you didn't know that they've changed it and you get hit by a truck that's your fault this is true yes so there's a, there's a lot of local uh advocacy groups in um portland who are very much opposed to this widening but the uh the the oregon department of transportation may manage to override them just because they can say well this is an interstate project or a regional project and we shouldn't take the uh, considerations of the neighborhood into account because people got to drive trucks from washington to california through there because that's how you know we've designed the interstate system to function since when is it ever that sunny in portland by the way mm, two days a year and then we're we're we're, we're going to go to florida do we have to which is the one David wants to talk about. Hell yeah, we're moving to Florida, where it's always sunny. I believe you'll find it's always sunny in Philadelphia. <laughs> do, 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 <laughs> do, do. Yeah, that's do, absolutely do, 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 true. Do. But don't come here. Yeah. So, it, so, so the, the, this, uh, the monstrosity that you're looking at is uh, Pines Boulevard, which is the one that uh, it goes uh, to the bot- from the bottom left to the top right, and then uh, Flamingo Road intersects it and uh you can kind of lose count of how many uh lanes are going or are intersecting there but it's basically three lanes in each direction with uh a double dedicated left turn lane in each direction and a dedicated right turn lane in each direction so you're you're basically traversing what's that like 12 uh (laughs) lanes in any one side I do see both roads have a bike lane, though. Yeah, well, you know, you want it to be accessible and, you know, like, pedestrian-friendly. And... It's, um, intersection gore. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, in, um, so in 2001, State Farm Insurance named this intersection the most dangerous intersection in the United States. 
and and they 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 did that by compiling uh, um, crash rankings or, or crash data from uh, January nineteen ninety nine to December two thousand, and uh, they they counted over that two years three hundred fifty seven accidents, and. Uh, 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 and, and I should also say that like numbers like two and three on that list are also in this general area. Uh, these are all just these massive arterial roads meeting at grade with each other. But where else? And, uh, how else are you going to get to the men's warehouse or the Chick Fil A? Yep. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. Clearly. Yeah. It's, it's the only way to do it. And actually, what is convenient is that further up, uh, just a little bit further out of frame here, is a hospital. So when you get decapitated in that the intersection, uh, you know the, the, your body, your organs are still. Yeah. Fresh the downside for, is uh, if you get decapitated. Or, well, let's say not decapitated, but let's say you get like mildly crushed or something at like the second or third worst intersection. There's a decent chance your ambulance is just going to get taken out on this one on the way to the hospital. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. And I actually I say decapitated because I've seen that. Like I, I would, I lived by this intersection, uh, growing up for like the first like eighteen, twenty years of my life, and uh, you just like see the like the most horrendous car accidents there, like all the time, all the time. So by by um, twenty twelve, they said that they had fixed most of this. Uh, they got rid of one uh, turn off of, uh, out of a mcdonald's that's a uh, it's just <laughs> how do you have an intersection with patch notes it's like well <laughs> well we got rid of the turn from mcdonald's um we eliminated one uh light phase uh you now have to make two turns to get to the chick-fil-a um yeah D- do drivers no longer clip through yeah <laughs> and this should prevent people from dying <laughs> problem solved yeah, they they did. They they um. Let's see. What what else did they do? They uh they lengthened the turn. They lengthened the turn lanes, and uh uh and uh, did some stuff to the median, and, uh to prevent more uh unnecessary left turns. And like and that's basically it. And they said that they that they reduced it. They also put in cool. red light cameras, so you get like a hundred and fifty dollar ticket for running the red light. And some sissy official gets a bunch of snuff moves. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, so, well, so, well, and the reason it was so dangerous was because if you even ran a yellow light, if you went on a yellow, this intersection is so enormous that by the time you get to the other side, it is fully red and the other side is ready to go. So that was uh, a lot of the T-boning that happened in that intersection was because it's Oof. just so enormous that even in a car, you can't get past it without... Uh, with, with yeah, God sign. forbid you're walking or you're on a bike. It sounds exactly like the Roosevelt Boulevard. Yeah, and you, and if you look uh, uh, closer into it, there there is no like median to stand on in the middle there. Like, at least nothing safely like sized to to wait for the next change. So yeah, it's really you can't get well, across this. I, as, uh, yeah. as I believe the here. same the same study the same State Farm uh, study that named this one of the most dangerous intersections in the United States also named. Two intersections on Roosevelt Boulevard in Philadelphia, the most dangerous intersections in the United States. Second and third. <laughs> Hell yeah, we podium twice. Yeah, it's it's fucking insane, and it's the same thing. You get uh, houses and stuff that are right on the boulevard, and then people doing whatever, like, 70 miles an hour. Uh, this is going to be some real angry criticism of northeast philly because it can fuck itself the, the great uh, northeast which is absolutely insane because you absolutely have people <laughs> fuck them join bucks county uh tons of people just die all the time on the boulevard and people are just like i, I can't imagine why it's so dangerous which is why we were first to get uh red light cameras yeah because people kept dying. <laughs> I, I love to watch people get turned into hamburger trying to turn into somewhere called, like, I don't know, the apartments at. Uh, yeah, like, I can, I can finish that for you. It's really just, like, anything that was uh, bulldozed to make for those apartments, like, make way for the apartments. So it's, like, apartments at yeah. Cypress Hill, right? Is it? <laughs> right, yeah. Or... Oh, shit, they demolished Boston to make Boston Market. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> I like that place. <laughs> <laughs> and you can just copy paste that intersection 
uh, just uh, north and south, up and down that entire region. What's uh, uh, actually what, one more thing about, about red light cameras is that most cities uh, rent them. They don't buy them and install huh. them. It's a rented service. And the, and the pamphlet that you get as a city official when you're being sold this red light camera service is um, you know, the, the, fee, the, the fee that you pay to rent it uh, will be um, smaller than the revenue that you get from tickets because they assume that it's built into the system that people will run red lights and that's the only way that this makes sense to, to run is, is if uh, you get enough infractions. Uh, and uh, up here in Albany, where I live, they installed red light cameras for a couple of uh, couple of years, and uh, but they weren't making enough money. They were actually spending money on the traffic cam- cameras. It, it wouldn't um, it wouldn't break even, and the, so they took a couple of them out uh, <laughs> because they don't they don't they don't work as as sold to these cities if mm. people don't run red lights. It's it's like it's you know it's it's like a you know running a bank on um uh, on overdraft fees you know it's it's the same it's the same sort of idea that you have to have infractions yeah, in order for the whole incentives. system to work. Yeah. Um, on the plus side, I'm I'm yeah. really glad that in under ten years, uh, you know, this being Florida, the whole thing is going to be under six feet of water, and that intersection will just be like one big deep trench. That can just kind of like form a kind of moat between like warring raider gangs and the like uh, above water neighborhoods. That's going to be cool. Unless we unless we yeah, dig you the can hole. See actually, yeah. all the canals. Unless we dig, right. you, you yeah. should you should yes. elaborate about the hole because this is coming. Yeah. Because I I posted on it on Twitter my idea to combat climate yeah, you, change. You you solved it. You solved climate change. Yeah, is to dig a large hole, and then all of the sea level rise can flow into the hole Very proud of you. as opposed to everywhere else <laughs> yeah that should be a, that should be a sequel to the movie uh the core oh yeah uh the <laughs> core i i, I my, my my suggestion <laughs> oh i'd watch that you've just done that one episode of futurama yeah my suggestion was uh to use the um giant coal uh lignite mining pits in central germany and just like we we burn the fossil fuels and then we create the hole and the sea level rise goes into the hole and it solves itself it's fine yeah it's fine oh no so we, we build the giant hole and we accidentally extinguish the core at the center of the earth. So then we need to send... <laughs> Just turning a hose pipe on it. So then we send a submarine with a nuclear bomb down the hole to reignite the, the core. The core. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's like a lawnmower. You just have to, like, jumpstart yeah. it a few yeah, times. Just open the choke, you know, just really, you know, put some, put some elbow grease into it. It'll so w- while we're disrupting climate change... You'll be happy to know that traffic engineers are disrupting um, intersections, right? Oh, good. So, you know, we have, like, exotic intersections, which are designed to reduce vehicle-to-vehicle conflicts. It's sort of at the expense of all other road users. This is something which is popular on Twitter recently. Uh, The Virginia Department of Transportation published a video on what they call a restricted crossing U-turn, right? Jesus wept. (laughs) All right. (laughs) I, I can't, I can't explain, I can't explain why, but this looks like a white supremacist <laughs> symbol. It's, it's, I mean, uh, fundamentally it is. Yeah. I just, I, I, I love <laughs> yeah, to be yeah, uh, crossing yeah. a, a freeway in the route of a Pac-Man ghost. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So uh, I, I guess I should explain how this works. Let's say you're turning right for, okay. So you got, you got one road, which, you know, you just go across the other road, you know, you got to do a thing. Right? So the idea mm-hmm. is if you're turning right, you just turn right. Or, excuse me, you just turn right through this outer one. If you're turning left, you have to go down into the special left turn lane. Then you wait for an intersection here. And then you come back around and go straight across. Or if you're going straight, you have to do the same thing. Right? And this. This Normal. reduces yeah, points of conflict between different paths for motor vehicles, right? Which makes it a little bit safer for motor vehicles, I, like, I do see statistically speaking. a problem, which is if you're using those crosswalks that are marked, the traffic's going to be coming at you from literally, I think, a different direction each time. 
Yes, if you're just trying to cross, you know, the street normally, you have to use five crosswalks instead of one. Five crosswalks, each in a different, like, bizarre direction. That's good cardio. Yes, and if you're a cyclist, they included bike lanes on these streets, right? There's no indication of how uh, a cyclist might actually use this intersection. I watched the video. They were like, well, you can either use the sidewalk or if you're more comfortable, you can ride in traffic. Um, I don't think Lance Armstrong could ride in traffic <laughs> in, in this intersection. This is, just, like, this is dodgeball I, with cars. Yeah, I mean, it's Frogger. <laughs> it's just straight Frogger. <laughs> I, I'm just imagining like both the air quality and the the the, the sound of walking in that little mm. diagonal part in the middle. I'd, yeah. I'd, I'd have asthma like, by the end of it. That, that I, I want to be the guy who has to like get on a zero turn mower and like clip the grass and all of those like elegantly fluted uh, like lawns there in the middle. That's gonna be fun. Oh my god. Oh my god. I don't want to do that. <laughs> Maybe I do. I, I'd get like I'd get hazard pay. Yeah, well, they they tapered to like two perfect little points. That's gonna be so fun to like be on a, like a ride on mower with like school buses and shit coming past you at seventy miles an hour. Or you're gonna have your boss say like, "Use the hedger," and they just for the whole <laughs> thing. <laughs> so yeah, this is one of several exotic intersections that modern traffic engineers are coming up with to you know. Increase safety, but only for, you know, drivers and other, you know, road uh, motor vehicle users, truckers, bus drivers, people on buses, so on and so forth, at the expense of pedestrians and cyclists. Um, you know, there's stuff like Diverging Diamonds, which was the cover, uh, the, the, the cover image of this or the first slide. There's uh, uh, stuff like the single point urban interchange. They're, they're all they're all dumb for anyone who's not in a car. Yeah, but on the other hand, they're all the top-rated things on the City Skylines workshop, so... This is true. So it's a land of contracts. <laughs> so, you know, we're stuck here, right? Um, you know, we're, we're, we're in a situation where traffic engineers and traffic engineering and the way we've structured our, you know, funding of infrastructure have uh, got us stuck in a situation where the only possible solution is to expand roads, right? And uh, the people who are, you know, working on doing traffic engineering, you know, they're generally like older, whiter people who live in suburbs and they drive everywhere. They don't see a reason why we might change our ways, well, that, right? That, 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 that's uh, political, and you're, you're doing politics now. Can't uh, do that. Sorry. <laughs> In college, when I was researching this uh, state uh, uh, highway corridor uh, redesign, they were thinking of putting in roundabouts in different parts of the uh, of the of the street. And um, uh, there were these all these meetings where these uh, boomers would stand up and one do this this the most elaborate math like back back of the napkin math uh, about how you know if you reduce speed by ten miles per hour. And the average person driving that car makes like sixty thousand dollars a year. Then, like you're losing ten million dollars an hour in lost like uh, productivity by reducing the speed of the road. It was really quite incredible stuff. But also that roundabouts are un-American. They're good enough for Europeans, maybe. But here in America, you know, we stop at rational right angles. I, okay. Very, very I, I, I think this is I think this is funny to contrast with the image I put here is um, this is a rational design which was come up with by New Jersey traffic engineers near Tom's River like it or not this is what peak performance looks like yes you'll notice this is a clover leaf intersection now what do you not notice what what do you notice is missing from a typical clover leaf intersection uh, overpasses yes what? so so what what's <laughs> happening what what why <laughs> why though? this 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 central intersection here only has uh you can only go straight through the intersection okay first of all homophobic yes <laughs> so it's canceled already right <laughs> if you want to go left you have to go through the clover leaf if you want to go right you have to go through the clover leaf right this was 
a rational, insane solution, which is determined apolitically by New Jersey traffic engineers um, to be the best solution for this location. Also note the uh, crosswalks, very pedestrian friendly, despite the fact that they do not link to anything. Sometimes you got to get onto like a little circle of uh, like completely dead grass and two trees. I want to go from dead grass circle hmm. to tree circle. And then half tree, half dead grass circle. They're completely different experiences. If, I, if I'm following the law, I have to parachute in here. <laughs> and somewhere in the middle is executive cellular phones. Yes. <laughs> you have to dodge traffic to get to your executive <laughs> cellular phone. I, I, you know, I, you know, the, it, this isn't even really like a metaphor anymore. You know, it's really just... Um, it's. It's like watching liberals trying to square some sort of mm -hmm. contradiction of capitalism, right? Where you're just like, uh, oh, there, there's like underlo serious underlying problems that they want to ignore. So instead, they'll make these ever widening and confusing uh, yeah. stopgap measures that don't ever solve the underlying problem. And they make everyone else go through more and more steps uh, to get to where they need to you, go. Are you saying yeah. that the New Jersey DOT has a plan for that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the subtext yeah. is just text now. And the text is, I, I don't know, a bunch of dead grass next to a Bahama breeze. Yeah. I'm sorry, I can't stop naming the stuff that's by intersections just because it, it, it so appeals to me on like some kind of psychic level. Yeah. Garden State Dental of Tom's River. And the friendlies. Yeah, it, pl pl place at Hot, other place. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Great. Artisan's Restaurant yeah. and Brewery. And, and the, the Wells Fargo is nice because like having an interstate or like at the very least a large uh, like high capacity road is good for if you want to rob the place. I'm trying to guess what the parking lot is in the bottom right because there's no cart corral. It's a mall. So, yeah. Oh, okay, it's a mall. There we go. All right. Yes. So yeah, I mean, traffic engineers—they don't want to change their ways. The public, which is a real problem, is like you know, common sense says if you widen a road, you'll be able to drive faster and you'll avoid congestion. And you know, the thing is, statistically, this is not the case, right? Um, but you don't have a lot of political support for, like, actual, you know, reforms that would reduce congestion, which would involve, uh, you know, not widening roads and improving public transportation. And then, like, you know, politicians, they want ribbon cuttings, which, you know, you get the, the, the most rational way to invest your political capital is to expand roads, because that's, like... Nice and easy. It's like, yeah, I widened the road. Hmm. Now it's, everyone's it, it's, happy, right? It's concrete, literally. And you create jobs for yes. that one guy with all the shovels. Bless it. Bless Steve. Yes, that's true. Steve with the shovel. Andrew Cuomo just uh, uh, opened, uh, did a ribbon cutting for a new off-ramp to the Albany International Airport by me. And uh, it was just like these goofy photos of him like giving thumbs up next to an exit <laughs> sign. That. Uh, that is just like so completely uh, uh, photoshoppable to just remove the Albany International Airport and put whatever you want like, on that sign and him giving a thumbs up. That's kind of the bold leadership that we need in these times of strife is to open an off ramp. Yeah. <laughs> I the, the, the thing is really is that highway construction at this point and road widening is a dead end technology, right? Unless you're like one of those autonomous cars, you know, believers who thinks we're going to have millisecond coordinated intersections, right? Uh, which I don't believe in. I think that's bullshit. Well, you, you, so, you just get a bad intersection like the one that we looked at, and instead of killing one or two people at a time, it's 500 as all of these like millisecond proof cars do, just fucking telescope into each other. Yeah, yeah. As soon as one car yeah, screws one up, it's, uh, every single car is just becomes a yeah. mash of like splinters of steel and human flesh. It's like you didn't <laughs> update Flash. <laughs> <laughs> Always knew the security updates would get me eventually. And, and the thing yeah. is, ultimately, like you know, improving the built environment for the sake of pedestrians, for the sake of you know cyclists, for the sake of road users other than cars is very 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 cheap 
um, it, 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 it's just restriping a lot of the times, but it requires taking space from drivers. And like, that's a political non-starter right now because, you know, there's so much congestion and we don't think that maybe giving space over from cars to something else might get us to our destinations more quickly. And, um, you know, I, I guess in short, we're up shit Creek. Um, cool. That's a bad way to end, but you know, here we are. <laughs> mm -hmm. We're we're all just merging across the enormous highway. Yes. In, into a, into a, a, a bold new Bahama breeze future. Yes. <laughs> we we live in a society. <laughs> that's society. We, we, we live in a society, but we're we're exiting to a Margaritaville. My God, I love Margaritaville. I'm not ashamed of it. <laughs> I I want to go to the Bahama Breeze now <laughs> just to see how it is. Coconut shrimp, delicious. So yeah, with with that at grade clover leaf, um, I guess you know that's that's where we are. Yeah, car bad, train good, horse agent of chaos, wild card. <laughs> yeah, a, a chaotic neutral. Um, uh, New Jersey Department of Transit cancelled. Um. Very much canceled. About that. I, I, I think in a, in a future communist future, we would keep the at grade clover leaf just because it's fine. <laughs> that someone thought this was a good idea. Yeah, the, 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 the way we execute landlords is we just put them in a car and just like fucking shoot them through that and just like see what happens. Very into it. It's just a, just a giant monument to uh, the, the past mm. and capitalist excess, and you just like put. Put uh, uh, the you know the the, the heads of, <laughs> of bosses and landlords like in each yeah. uh, different circle, and you can visit. This them. isn't even excess. It's this true. is like the worst of capitalism because they they would splurge for like a clover leaf, but they wouldn't build an overpass. Just, just like four sad crosswalks. Yeah, that that's because you you know that there was someone in the townhouses in the upper left hand corner like scared that they would see the overpass. And they're like, I don't want to see a highway. I want to protect the character mm. of the I neighborhood. I believe that the townhouses came later. I think the the, the at grade cloverleaf was an experiment in the New Jersey Tra uh, Department of Transportation. I feel like that could be a whole episode to be, you know, how how every single intersection in New Jersey is like a piece of abstract performance art. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, New <laughs> Jersey is the ultimate <laughs> engineering disaster. I, I feel like you, you, what you just described is uh, the more true version. The spiritually true. Is, yeah. Or yours is the more factual, and mine is the more truthful. Yes. Yours is it's factual. More, it, more truthiness. As, 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 truth. as my old parish priest used yeah. to say, it may not be literally Feeling true, but it contains a moral truth. There you yes. go. So that's the episode, which has run way over time. Sorry, um, everybody. Yeah. You're welcome. Next week, we're doing the Tacoma Narrows Bridge Collapse. That's going to be so good. I can't wait. It's going to be a wait. good episode, yeah. yeah. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, does <laughs> anyone have anything to pitch before we go? Um... Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, listen you go, to you go first Future, which is available anywhere uh, podcasts are sold. Uh, I uh, listen to... Uh, Listen to Iron Weeds also, maybe. And then uh, uh, I have a, uh, you can read Real Life, reallifemag.com. I hope I got that right. Uh, where I, I just posted something about how um, uh, ghost, the show Ghost Adventures on the Travel Channel like makes us all feel special in the different sorts of suburbs, Sweet. boring suburbs we live in. Uh, that was a bunch, of, that was really fun to write. Uh, and uh, pretty soon we're going to release the uh, the call for papers for uh, Theorizing the Web, a, a fun conference that I do in New York City every year where uh, people talk about uh, society and, and the internet in a way that uh, doesn't uh, uh, say the word <laughs> disruption 5,000 times. Yes. It's, uh, it's, it's actually you know people mm. who care more about society than technology. It's it's a it's a lot of fun. We live stream the whole thing also. Yeah. So you can, da da David's you can um, come on Trash Future if you like. Oh, absolutely. Yes, that would be good. And I was on Theorizing the Web last year, so you know there's a live stream if you want to hear more of me talking. Mm -hmm. And you were also um, on Trash Future if you dig back in our archives. I I was yeah. also on Trash Future. Yes, and I have a thing to pitch. Cool. Because I have to do I have to do penance. 
because I screwed up my voter registration this year. You motherfucker. Uh I know, right? (laughs) That's the most important part of politics, is the voting Yeah, pretty much, yeah. So, um, if you're watching this the day it comes out, which should be November 5th, 2019, right? Um, And hopefully early in the morning. I, I don't know how long it'll take me to edit this. Um, when you go to the polls today, and this is if you're in Philadelphia, do not vote straight ticket Democrat, right? You you have five votes to spend on at-large city council candidates, and what you should do is vote for your three favorite Democrats and then the two working families candidates, right? Those are Kendra Brooks and Nick O'Rourke. Right, they're number seven sixteen and seven seventeen. Uh, this is because two seats on city council are reserved for non-democratic party candidates, and traditionally that's gone to Republicans. Um, now, if everyone votes for working family parties candidates, as opposed to the Republicans. We can change that around and kick the Republicans off of city council, and we'll have, you know, working families party candidates who will fight for working class interests. And, uh, you know, if you're, if you're, if you have a problem with that because, you know, the working families party endorsed Elizabeth Warren, I understand, but, you know, I too am a racist and sexist <laughs> Bernie bro. Um, yeah, j- just and do I it. can stomach it. Just so, it. yeah, just, just do and, it. Uh, just, incidentally, just do it. On, on the same lines, if you're in the UK, uh, election coming up in six weeks, register to vote now. The deadline is, I think, the 29th of November. So, register to vote. Do it. And one more. Yes. Uh, still in Philadelphia. Uh, so there's a ballot proposal uh, statewide in Pennsylvania, which would uh, called Marcy's Law. Uh, this would uh, give quote a bill of rights to crime victims, but also totally fuck up all sorts of protections we have for accused people, uh, which would further totally screw them over in places like rural Pennsylvania, which are already super racist, and it will you know the ACLU has already filed against it, but. Please do not vote for that. It is a wild violation of all sorts of due process laws. Yes, vote no on that. There's also new voting machines in Philadelphia, so take the time to figure them out. I'm going to link a video in the description. Um, And thanks a lot, guys. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, Good night, everyone. Good night, everybody. I forgot one more thing. There's one more thing I I, I forgot to say. Uh, Uh. Jeffrey Epstein was murdered.